The next data structure that we're going to consider in this course is the graph. A graph is a data structure that contains vertices and edges. The edges that connect vertices may be directed, that is, they point from one vertex to another, or undirected, that is, they simply indicate that two vertices have a connection. Both types of graphs are useful for representing both virtual and real-world networks. Directed graphs can represent the flow of packets in a network or other kinds of unidirectional information flow. The computers in the network are vertices in the graph, and the packets or other messages they transmit are the edges. Some transportation networks, such as the air transportation network, can be modeled as directed graphs, in which the vertices are airports, and the edges are flights that you can take between those airports. Even social networks can be modeled as directed graphs, in which people are the vertices, and communications among them, letters, emails, text messages, are edges. Undirected graphs are useful for representing lots of things too electric circuit net lists, transportation networks with two-way travel, and social networks viewed from a slightly different perspective, in which people are either friends or not friends, and friendship is always a two-way street. The route we can take to get from one vertex to another in the graph is called a path. A path may contain multiple edges. The length of a path is the number of edges that it includes. There may be many paths between two vertices. There's more than one way to fly from Vancouver to St. John's. This is especially true when we consider cycles, paths that go through the same vertex more than once. Although this diagram only shows eastbound flights, you could fly back and forth between Toronto and Montreal all day long if you wanted to, adding two, four, six, eight or more segments to your trip. You wouldn't want to do that, but you could. The number of edges that a vertex touches is called its degree. A high degree vertex is one that is involved in a lot of edges. In a directed graph, we can split a vertex's degree into in-degree, the number of edges pointing to the vertex, and out-degree, the number of edges pointing away from it. This graph shows the in- and out-degree distributions of English Wikipedia articles, where the vertices are articles and the edges are hyperlinks among them. From this graph, we can see that articles tend to have higher in-degree than out-degree. There are a few articles that are linked to from tens or even hundreds of thousands of other articles, but we don't see articles that link to tens of thousands of other articles. This should intuitively make sense to us. A graph is a very general concept, but there are a few special cases that are worth understanding. First, when a graph has no cycles in it, we call it acyclic. Directed acyclic graphs are so common that we often refer to them by the acronym DAG, or DAG, Directed Acyclic Graph. Among other things, DAGs can be used to represent dependency graphs, which express the dependencies that various parts of a project or process have on other parts. These graphs are used extensively in project management, sometimes illustrated with a Gantt chart, but we've already seen some examples of dependency graphs in this course, makefiles. One of the most fundamental things that a makefile does is to specify which files depend on which files, so that we can rebuild only those things that actually need to be rebuilt when we change, for example, one source file within a large project. A further specialization of DAGs can be found when every vertex has an in degree of no more than one. In that case, the graph that we end up with is actually a tree. If we specialize further, by limiting every node to an out degree of one, we end up with a linked list. When we want to actually build a graph data structure, we have one important choice to make quite early on, how to represent the edges. Representing vertices is fairly straightforward. We will need some kind of iterable container, whether that be a linear data structure or something like a binary search tree that can be used to efficiently look up specific vertices by a name. When choosing a representation for the edges, however, we have to choose between two main approaches. The first is an adjacency matrix, an n by n matrix, where n is equal to the magnitude of v, the number of vertices in the graph, in which the space at i, j can be used to indicate whether or not there is an edge between vertices i and j, or, in a more sophisticated design, where to find the object that represents the edge between i and j. The adjacency matrix approach works well for dense graphs, which are highly connected. Most graphs, however, are not dense but sparse, with many fewer edges than would be theoretically possible. For example, many social networking sites have millions or even billions of users, but most of those users do not have millions of connections to millions of other users. When a graph is sparse, we will often prefer an adjacency list holding all the edges, or multiple adjacency lists, with each vertex holding a list of its edges. So then, 
Graphs are data structures with vertices and edges. They can be directed or undirected, and their paths can be cyclic or acyclic. Each vertex has a degree, and if we constrain the degrees of the nodes, we end up with special cases like trees and linked lists. A graph representation can store its edges in an adjacency matrix, an adjacency list, or in multiple adjacency lists. That's enough of the basics for now to get you going. Let's try our hands at some exercises.